Good morning, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to the Dolly Museum and to our Coffee with a Curator. So let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. Many of you know Beth very well. A number of you have been here when she's done presentations in the past. She's the Director of Photography at the Morian Arts Center. She has been there since 1997, so going back a few years. Um, she's a native of St. Pete. She earned her master's degree in fine art and photography at the University of Hartford. She's a photography educator, and she's been doing this for 30 years. She is focused on a variety of things, including documentary, fine arts, and portraiture photography. Did a great presentation on um, the Horst exhibition, showing how uh, fashion photography is done. She teaches all levels of photography and expertise in leading travel photo adventure groups, like the one workshop that I mentioned earlier. Um, in 1997, she started the photography program at the Moray Art Center, which she is now also in charge of. Uh, she spent a number of years in uh, New England doing photography, and that's part of what's going to be uh, discussed in the, the talk this morning about that sense of home and going away from home and coming back. And her work's included in a number of uh, collections, including the Ringling Museum of Art in Sarasota. And right now, there's an exhibition at the Florida Museum of Photography over in Tampa. It's the first photo laureate for the city. She was the first photo laureate for the city of Tampa in 2003. The exhibition photo focuses on laureate photography. Hers is included as well, so hopefully you'll get a chance to see that. Please join me now in welcoming mm -hmm. Beth Reynolds. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's great to see such a wonderful big crowd here to learn more about Clyde Butcher, about the work, and about this idea of a sense of home. And St. Petersburg, of course, is close to my heart. I'm a native here, and I have gone away and lived other places, and I am going to talk a little bit about how that coming home has inspired my artwork and how I feel it really inspires a lot of artists. So. I would like to thank Peter for inviting me back to come and speak. I always enjoy this. And we, at the Morian Arts Center, we collaborate with the Dali on a lot of their exhibitions to provide educational opportunities. And it's one of the things I love about the arts in St. Petersburg, and that is the collaborative nature of what the museums do with us. Because we're a community art center. We're not a collecting museum. We have wonderful rotating galleries of artwork. We provide education in the arts at all levels in just about every single medium you could think of and provide our local artists with a place to exhibit their work and to become the artists that we know that they can become. And so when we have a chance like this, I really appreciate all the, the work that goes into with the MFA, with the DALI, and all, all of our other museums that are coming up. I mean, it's really quite amazing to see how what an arts mecca we've become. So I'm thrilled to see how much the city has been supporting the arts and, and coming along with all of that. So and when I was talking to Peter about what what we would talk about with Clyde, and he is somebody I met um, back in 1996. I first met him and I met him at Mainsail because he had a booth at Mainsail, you know, your standard uh, you know 10 by 20 not even, I think it was a 10 by 10. He had a pop-up tent. He had his work hanging, just like every other artist you see at main sale. And he was sitting in his booth, manning his own booth by himself, and selling his work. And I bought a couple of prints from him. I knew who he was and loved it. And uh, it was a big splurge for me. It was a, it was a big deal, because as an artist, obviously, we, you know, we're not rolling in the dough. But I really was just drawn to his work because I felt like I could walk into it. I felt like his images put me in that location. I could just, I could hear the ocean and I could smell the salt. I could, I could smell the swamp water and just thought, this is, this is amazing. So I was very grateful that I was um, early on board with him and have enjoyed watching his work grow. So home is a big word, means a lot of things to a lot of people, and where you call home or what you consider home can vary quite a bit. But as an artist, we always seem to find home as some sort of an inspiration. It might be tragic, it might be fabulous. So it can go either way. I happen to find it very inspiring and beautiful and amazing. Eliza Cook is a wonderful poet and author, if you don't know her work. Look her up, she'll be very in inspiring to you. 
So home, obviously, definition, a familiar or unusual, a usual setting, a residence, a place of origin. So I put up a picture here of Amalfi, Italy, and I was privileged to go there in 2016, and my sister's here with me today. Our grandfather was born in Amalfi, and that is his home and where he came from and before he came to the United States. And last year I made, or in 2016, I made that trip back. And our mother was very strong in her Italianness and <laughs> embraced it and loved it and really loved being all that it was. And so when I had the opportunity, and Amalfi, for those of you who have been here, been there, is not a big place. It's a small little village that has not changed a whole lot. And so walking around Amalfi with my grandfather's birth certificate and showing it around and looking for the church where he was christened and had his um, his church lessons and walking through the streets and knowing he had stepped there, standing on the shores and photographing and feeling that drawn sense to connecting to my family and to this landscape that was so amazingly beautiful but so different from what we have here. And so I made some very um, unusual pictures for myself in color and very artistic and worked on post-production to sort of create that old feel of what I thought my grandfather might have seen when he was standing on the shores of Amalfi. So this is one of my other homes. I've been at the Art Center for a very long time, not only um, at the location where we're at, or the Red Wave, but the previous building in the 70s. My sister took pottery classes there. She takes drawing classes now. My nephew comes to art classes. I took painting classes at the previous building, which is why I'm a photographer. Uh, <laughs> I did not take to the painting and drawing very well. Uh, so thank goodness they, we had a photography program. But so this is a home to me. And so I photograph it on a regular basis. I photograph our building, our interior, the people inside, the sense. And that is a home. That is where I feel a sense of belonging and feel drawn to. So obviously our childhood homes are a place that can be very inspirational. As Dali found his home in Spain, very inspirational. The house that I grew up in, that I knew most of my life, that my mother had decorated in her Italianness, of <laughs> blue shag carpet, blue velvet, blue velvet curtains, flocked wallpaper in every single room, white French provincial furniture in every single room, and if you could paint it gold, it was gold. <laughs> Uh, and so this was my childhood room, and I had to fight for years to be able to put up my sports plaques on the wall. That was a major, because they did not go to the decor, and they were not barely gold. So <laughs> when we realized that my mother was going to be leaving this home, I set out to make photographs of the house, of the interior, and make landscape pictures of this and document this for my personal satisfaction, my memory, but to also to show my mom when she would have trouble remembering or think about the house that she designed this house from the ground up. She decorated it and took full control of that, and it was a beautiful place to grow up. Um, <laughs> I wasn't joking about the blue. <laughs> or the gold. It's everywhere, and it was everywhere. Uh, and so you can see the different perspectives I took to really get down low and capture the blue shag carpeting, <laughs> which I had to rake on Saturdays as a child as part of my chores, and the beautiful curtains, the ornate lamps of Romeo and Juliet, who were also wearing green velvet outfits. And then the other of her bedroom with the beautiful, you know, custom balances with the tassels. And it was truly amazing um, to watch. And when my friends would come over in elementary school, they would just walk around and be like, 
Wow. <laughs> this looks like a palace. <laughs> right in the middle of Pinellas County. And we lived on a dirt road. <laughs> it, was, it, was, um, it was different for the neighborhood. This, this was the dining room. I don't know how many of you had a formal dining room, but we had um, a 12-foot dining room table. And I had to set the table for any holiday three to four days in advance because it was a formal place setting. And so this was the last. We had sold the table, and these were the last chairs that were left. And that, I will tell you, that's a replacement chandelier that we put in because we had sold the other one. The other one was about six times that size. <laughs> and we sold it in the estate sale. But that is, that is blue velvet flocked wallpaper, and those are blue velvet chairs. So then there's Florida, and we, you know, I was gonna put Florida, because we get made fun of a lot, because we have a lot of special crazy people here in Florida doing some strange things. Uh, but I find Florida to be just so incredibly beautiful. I've lived in North Carolina, it was beautiful. I've lived in Connecticut, and I lived in Massachusetts. <laughs> all beautiful places, but they weren't Florida. And I've tried over the years to really figure out why is it that I felt really inspired by this, and it wasn't until I actually moved to Massachusetts and spent some time there, and then subsequently came back to visit that I really discovered and had some aha moments about why I was drawn to being here. So this is, uh, you know, this is Pull Off on the Side of the Road by Gandhi Bridge. Uh, if you guys don't take the Gandhi, you should. It's a really beautiful drive. It's so much nicer than going over the Howard Franklin. Uh, Gandhi has beautiful beaches on both sides and trees growing and just really lovely scenery that you can really pull off and see. And so one of the aha moments I had living in Massachusetts, I was living, you know, not in Boston, not in a city and not near the ocean, which is, of course, a draw for me, but I was living in western Massachusetts, uh, just off the Mohawk Trail, right in the middle of the state on the Connecticut River in a little town called Greenfield. And it's right where Massachusetts, Vermont, and, and, and New Hampshire meet. There's a little triangle of all three states that come together. And so this is called the Pioneer Valley. And so I was living in a valley, and what I realized was that when I would go outside, in order for me to see sunshine, I had to do this. <laughs> because I was surrounded by the Mount Holyoke range of mountains and various other mountains, Monadnock and Mount Tom, and I was in a bowl. I was in a valley. And so I, my horizon line was here. And I walked around eye level, staring at rocks and mountains, which were, of course, beautiful. I, I thought they were lovely. But I began to feel claustrophobic. And it was, it was a difficult thing to figure out. Like, why was I not? I had a great job. I had a great boyfriend. I was making new friends. And I was like, why? I'm not inspired. I didn't go out and photograph. I was not going out and photographing. And I felt closed in. And it wasn't until a couple of first visits home here that I started to realize that, well, growing up my whole life, my horizon line has been where? At my waist. This is my horizon line in Florida. And I have this expansiveness of vision, of being able to see far and to be able to sit and contemplate. I can't contemplate staring at the side of a mountain, especially when it's right in my backyard. Like my backyard was like straight up and you would just be there. And you, you really had to hike somewhere to the t top of Mount Sugarloaf to get any sort of a, a vista feel for the horizon to be below you. And I really started identifying that and understanding what it was about coming home that gave me this sense of relief, this sense of peace, this sense of I feel inspired and wanted to make pictures. 
And so when I went back home to, to Massachusetts, I was trying to get up high or trying to find those wide open places to photograph, and I didn't find much of it. Um, but when I did, I enjoyed it and, and loved it. But traditional Florida summer, our clouds growing, our water, trees right on the shoreline, things you never see up in New England. Fort DeSoto, favorite place. You wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily probably take a picture you know, like this of the lifeguard stand, but the light was hitting it that night, and I gave it this composition because I loved the clouds and the sky, and I just envisioned sitting up there having this beautiful view of all of North Beach and seeing the sandbars and the, the pelicans go by, and it just looked like a magical spot to rise up and, and sit in. This is Arapica, and anybody know where Arapica is? Yep. All right, you should go. If you've not been, you're just gonna drive straight up the coast, and it is a gorgeous small town, very natural, wild, the rivers are running through it. It's just beautiful. But Arapica is just a natural Florida place that is a really wonderful day trip for you to take. And this is just about off the side of the road that I was with some of my photo students. And this also I find so inspiring because this is just that primordial, natural, untouched place in Florida that you start to think like, wow, you know, this is where our native tribes were fishing and hunting and building their shell mounds and raising their families. And I just find that so incredibly beautiful. Also Fort DeSoto, such a huge park to explore. If you only go out there and go to one place, you really should explore the entire horseshoe from from east to north and south and really find all the little nooks and crannies because this is such a beautiful area. And I have a tide app in my phone so I know when it's low tide, when I might see good things exposed and a lot of the driftwood and make my way out. And it doesn't have to be sunny, beautiful overcast days. Weather doesn't play a factor for me. Of course, I love the big clouds and everything, but these beautiful overcast days are just as wonderful. And again, finding that low angle, that great expanse, and the simplicity of just nature doing its thing. So of course, I'm so on my visits home, knowing that this was going to be no more, I spent a lot of time photographing, but not, not so much the structure of our upside down triangle, for which I did play mini golf on the top of when I was a kid. Thought that was fabulous, uh, but Spa Beach, and nobody ever went down there. I can't even tell you how a thousand times I'd go walk down on that little piece of beach and there was never anybody there. And I just thought it was the most beautiful little piece of beach and that's where I photographed the pier a lot from and just loved sitting there and you could walk out and it was just really lovely. So Gandhi in color, beautiful sunsets. I got to tell you, this summer has been particularly amazing for sunsets. The clouds we've had, the storms coming through, they have just been really dramatic and really love them. And, you know, a sunset is a sunset. I love them. I, I know they're cliche, but they make me happy. <laughs> and that's really what matters as an artist. I make photography that makes me happy. If it happens to make you happy, that's just bonus. I make it for me, I, the act of photography, the actual stopping, admiring, looking at the light and being inspired gives me peace, gives me happiness, taking the photograph. And to be truthful, if I never saw it again, I'd be okay because it's the act of documenting it and the act of being there in that place and observing it that gives me the happiness, my observational powers. And so moving it forward in the processing is also just gravy. And when you guys like it, you know, it's like little sprinkles on the ice cream. So it's for me, but I hope you enjoy it 
and then that is you know, how the happiness goes around in the world. This is Lassing Park. Anybody know where that is? Oh, good, because sometimes I say Lassing Park and people are like, what? Um, this is Beach Drive South. This is Old Southeast. So um, go, to, go to the Chataway and get a burger, and then instead of going back into town, go down the road to the end and take a left, and Lassing Park will be there. It's a big open space, huge beach on the bay, <coughs> and it's shallows. Like you can walk a mile out and the water only gets up to your knees or your thighs and at low tide it's just beautiful. There's like little conch shells wandering all around. There's tons of wading birds. There's um, people going out in their paddle boards or kite surfers and it's a wonderful little space and at dusk particularly the birds come in to start feeding and roosting on some of the trees there. So this was you know, pretty much the sun had gone down, lost a lot of light, but these four birds were just hanging out, looking for some dinner, and I just found it so beautiful. So now, here's a beautiful place that most of you might not think and walk by. This is Lake Megory. So this is MLK South, and abuts to, it's part of the Boyd Hill Nature Preserve. And there's two entrances on MLK that you can pull in and park. There's usually a bunch of old guys playing dominoes under one of the um, picnic areas. But I live across the street from here. And so I have become enamored with Lake Megory. And the, my only memory of this lake growing up was the um, southeastern boat regattas, where the hydroplane races we used to have on the lake. Not sure how well, anybody thought having hydroplane races on a lake full of alligators was, but <laughs> there you go. And so I go out here and I photograph, I kayak here, and I walk my dogs in this park. And the expansiveness and the beauty of this at sunset is just overwhelming. Beautiful, just rows of sable palms, and they're just bent with the wind, and I rarely see anybody on this lake. It's so underutilized, and it's such a beautiful place. You'll see a couple of people cast netting or fishing from the shore. I hardly ever see anybody in there with their kayak. I go out there kayaking, there's no one. And it's, this is a place you should go and explore. You can either get there through Boyd Hill or just through the park entrance, and go and take a look at how beautiful this is. So a uh, little bit about Clyde. We all know he studied architecture. He's been married to Nikki for over 50 years. Uh, he moved to Fort Lauderdale. They lived on a boat, so they're very attached to the water, and they're very much water people. He was doing the standard art festivals. But it wasn't until after the death of his son that he went into black and white and he really went into the big Cyprus to find solace and to try and come to peace with the loss of, of their son. So he started out using these very large format cameras, as a lot of you know. He's doing digital now because it's the, the quality has risen up to that of film, and he's using a very specific lens mounts with a tilt shift that allows you to get the same effects as the large format. But this far one on the, on the left with the red, that's a 20 by 24. That is a, the film on that is this big. And so when you go to photograph with these kinds of cameras, just as Ansel did, you're not going out reeling off two, 300 pictures. <laughs> you are going out to have a meditative Zen experience with your world, whatever it is you're gonna photograph. And for Clyde, it was paddling solo through the swamps and finding that one place, that location, that those tree branches, that piece of water, that fern, that orchid that really spoke to him. And maybe he made three or four pictures while he was out there on that one trip, and that was it. It wasn't like in this day and age now where we come home from a vacation and we have a thousand photographs, and then we never look at them again. 
And if you want help with that, you can come see me at the Maureen Art Center <laughs> and take my photo class. In relationship to Dali and the inspiration that he found in his Spain and his home, if you are to look at Clyde's pictures that he documented and then go back and look at Dali's work, you see that the, the textures, the branches, the trees, all of those things that become present in Dali's are not so crazy dreamlike. They're things he was really pulling from his home and inserting these little bits of from color to texture to the line of a tree into his work. And that's what Clyde really found and really did find that connection. And here this incredibly dreamlike, it looks like a little fairy house, like little gnomes are gonna come running out of it, <laughs> right on the Santa Fe River, Loxahatchee, beautiful light. But as you can see, look at the way the, you know, the vines come sweeping down and they're not dissimilar to the way you see Dali propped up with a branch and the way things drip and sort of hang off of things and look very fluid. You see that here in the swamps. You see how that even Clyde is photographing these very surreal, beautiful places. And Dali was finding that inspiration too, but he was just putting it into paintings and then pushing it a little further instead of Clyde being just the true documentarian. But I feel these have the same sort of ethereal, surreal, unbelievable dreamlike essence that Dali's work does. That's why Clyde was such a perfect match to send to document Spain. Look at the texture in that tree, that beautiful, line and the curve, and even though it's a tree that's died and it's fallen over, it, it calls you and says, come sit here. It has a romantic feeling of the ocean and the fog and is so inviting. You feel like you could walk right onto it. Some of his most famous right down in Naples. And a lot of these little islands down Naples and uh, where Kaya Costa is, these are just tiny little island things that you have to take a boat to get to. And so you have to, you have to make decisions to go find these beautiful places as um, you gotta get out of the car. <laughs> That's just all there is to it, people. You gotta put your tennis shoes on, you gotta put your wellies on, and you gotta get out of the car. And you've got to, to make these journeys to go see these things that we are so much more than golf courses and strip malls and Disney World that look at that horizon line. Look at where the sky meets the ocean and the peace that comes with that and that beautiful curve of driftwood, again, inviting you to just come sit there and listen to the waves. <laughs> Jupiter, blowing rock. I thought this was particularly a good match and relates well to um, some of the pictures from Spain with that coast of the rocks and some of these textures that Dali worked into uh, his landscapes and, and added and the waves crashing. I mean, if you had showed this to people they would say this doesn't exist, or if you saw it in a painting, you'd say that came out of somebody's creative mind. And no, it is this beautiful giant tree that has just evolved and become one with nature. And think of all the little critters that are living in here and the insects in the home and how vibrant this tree still is. But look, you can just see like through that hole at the top, you feel like your eye just can go right through there and it seems so much more expansive. It seems giant. And it's, it, you know, it's not 20 feet wide. It's probably like six or seven feet wide. But in the way that Clyde has brought you close and into it, and again, even though this isn't one of his expansive landscapes, this is still home. This is a, this is a Florida look. You're not going to see this in Kansas. 
and you're not going to see it in a lot of places. This is weathered, salted, winded Florida. I love this quote by Clyde of what, what inspires you? And if you are not particularly an artist, and I think everybody actually is, you just haven't allowed the fear of it to, to get over it, because if you can let your fear go, everybody's an artist. Everybody can go out. You can go out with your cell phone, with your point and shoot camera, and you can get out of the car <laughs> and go walk somewhere, and it doesn't have to be a hike. I'm not saying you gotta strap on a camel back and a, and a 50 pound pack and take three days of snacks. You can go to a lot of our parks and just drive through them and get off right, on the, right there on the trail and see some of the most beautiful and amazing things. So maybe August isn't the best month to do that. Maybe you wait till November, but it's all here. You can go onto the Florida State, um, look at the park list, get yourself a map, and plot yourself a couple of weekend trips to go out and take a look at these things. And what is it that Dali found inspiring about his home to incorporate into his paintings and what Clyde has done to bring this to light for conservation purposes because our our Everglades is being polluted every day, and we're losing hundreds of acres of it to development and to um, pollution, and we have to stop it. It's just got to, because if our Everglades are not healthy, the rest of the state is gonna go downhill. And not just that, but the surrounding oceans. And it's gonna be pretty devastating for the futures to, to come, and so, it can be as simple as your cell phone. It can be as simple as you walking around your neighborhood and saying, you chose to live in this neighborhood. What do you find inspiring about it? Is it your neighbors? Is it the landscape of your neighborhood? Is it the people? Photograph them. Make documents. Tell your story of you and your home and make that your inspiration to create some amazing art. Thank you.